All right, let's let's get the morning started. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our December up in Adam. Uh, we are very pleased to have Jonathan Sertain of uh, BWX Technologies speak to us today, and and we're we're thankful for uh, the support from BWXT for this up in Adam and all the uh, support they give us throughout the year. So wonderful to be here. Um, I. Don't have any announcements right now. At the end, we can talk a little bit about some upcoming things, but without uh, any further uh, discussion, let's move forward with uh, Jonathan given his presentation. So let me introduce Jonathan. He's the uh, Chief Technology Officer at BWXT. And in this role, he's responsible for the identification and development of new technologies for the company integrating expertise and resources across the enterprise. Prior to joining BWXT, he founded Astria Inc., which was a small business created to design and develop a platform for machine learning and data science analytics, utilizing earth observing satellite and in situ data sources. Prior to his entrepreneurship, uh, Dr. Sertain spent nine years at NASA. Among his various uh, appointments and honors, he serves on a number of advisory committees, including those for NASA, the National Science Foundation, uh, NOAA, the US Office of Science and Technology Policy, National Academy of Science and Engineering, and the Royal Academy of Science, uh, as well as the European Space Agency and for new, numerous universities. So Jonathan, uh, please, uh, feel free to go ahead. And, and what we usually do in the past for those, and I, I guess I didn't give some of the ground rules, uh, we'll let John, Jonathan talk. Um, if you have any questions, you can either type them in the Q&A, the chat, or go down to the buttons at the bottom and you can raise your hand and, and that way we can you know uh, bring you into the meeting at that time. But either way, whichever way you feel comfortable, uh, feel free to, to type in some questions or ask some questions. So, Jonathan. Thank you, Jim. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, the last time I had the opportunity to give this, uh, give an up and Adam talk, I, I had the occasion to be in Aiken for my first time. And uh, I wish we were in the state of the world where that were possible again, because I certainly enjoyed my time in Aiken. Um, but uh, I think, it, I do still enjoy the opportunity to introduce um, the various areas of uh, uh, interest that that I personally have uh, in, in nuclear. And <clears throat> hopefully you'll find what I have to present today interesting as well. So perhaps we can go to the next slide. Before I dive into the, the more general um, aspect of our talk, I thought it would be a, um, important just to introduce what BWXT um, does across its uh, different businesses. Um, that way, as I talk about the various areas of uh, um, uh, nuclear technology development, it kind of puts it in context where it fits in within BWXT just to um, tie a bow between where BWXT might play a role and where the larger nuclear supply chain um, fits in. We're organized in three business units, uh, nuclear operations, nuclear power, and nuclear services. Uh, we, we, we like to think of nuclear operations as the naval reactors business, but in fact, it actually does a variety of different things, including uh, the development of uh, reactor fuels for, a, for, for several uh, research reactors, medical targets uh, for the production of uh, uh, molybdenum 99 um, primarily. Uh, and we have customers with uh, national labs and, and international customers through that business. Nuclear power, uh, we think of that one as all things Canadian, uh, can-do reactors uh, and uh, refurbishment for the can-do fleet, uh, as well as uh, our medical isotope business is located there. And then nuclear services, um, uh, where Dara and I um, both hail from, uh, that's our um, management operations group that does a lot of uh, facility operations across the DOE and. NASA complex, but also where we do a lot of our advanced technology development. So these three different business units um, all have a variety of different expert uh, expertise in engineering and design for nuclear systems. Um, and as a consequence, we have kind of a broad interest 
uh, in, in these various different areas. And that's, that's kind of how my talk is organized. Uh, gen generally speaking, I, I wanna talk about the various areas of technology development and how they play a role in uh, the variety of areas that BWXT participates in the nuclear industry. So next slide. Um, I think everybody on this call is gonna be intimately familiar with the nuclear that we know. Uh, power plants in particular since the uh, 50s and 60s uh, have been a very you know, prolific use uh, of nuclear uh, energy. But um, for BWXT, our primary interest has always been uh, or originated from, uh, at least as far as nuclear is concerned, submarines and aircraft carriers. So when Rick Over first started the nuclear Navy, uh, Babcock and Wilcox at the time got into the manufacture of pressure, pressure vessels and other things that were necessary for submarines and aircraft carriers to utilize that power, power source. Of course, nuclear weapons, uh, but also environmental cleanup. Though these are all areas of significant investment and revenue uh, for the nuclear that we know. Uh, but the next slide, it's the nuclear that we need that I wanna focus on today. Um, one of the reasons I joined BWXT was the CEO offered me the opportunity to work on uh, advanced propulsion systems for deep space exploration. Uh, today, we, we call that nuclear thermal propulsion within BWXT, but NASA calls that space nuclear propulsion. Uh, DOE and Idaho National Lab uh, are both looking into space nuclear propulsion. I'm going to talk about that uh, in, uh, in some detail in a moment. Nuclear thermal propulsion, space nuclear, however you want to phrase it, uh, basically is a high temperature gas reactor. Um, whether that's for nuclear electric or nuclear thermal, uh, you, you essentially have to um, heat up a gas and use that gas uh, and the uh, energy extraction, the thermal energy conversion from uh, to, to do something novel, whether that's just out the exhaust or uh, through some sort of active cycle for conversion into electricity, uh, high temperature gas reactors for space uh, is a, an emerging area of uh, interest for the US government. Also, uh, the US government and uh, perhaps the commercial market, market are interested in micro reactors, a variety of which is a high temperature gas reactor uh, for um, power production. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I feel like the nuclear we need is associated with micro reactors. It may not, everyone may not agree that additive manufacturing is a component of the nuclear we need, but I'm gonna argue uh, this evening or this, this morning, and given that you can only chat in a little window that I can't see, I get to argue with myself effectively that additive manufacturing is a component of the nuclear we need. And the reason why I believe that to be the case uh, because within Industry 4.0, the, the, the use of cyber mechanics, the combination of humans and robotic uh, um, semi-autonomous machines, really can offer us opportunities for the acceleration of manufacturing, but also through the automation of manufacturing, much like Tesla has been doing, you can in, in improve the throughput of a system in such a way that the economics uh, may eventually become advantageous in ways that benefit an industry uh, and allow that industry to expand its market share in areas where it hadn't that market share previously. And electric cars is a great example of that. And so uh, as I talk through my advanced manufacturing argument, I'll uh, draw relationships to, to electric cars uh, simply because I feel like that's a compelling argument for, for how automation, how a gigafactory, if you will, uh, would, would be of benefit for nuclear, improving the cost per kilowatt hour, uh, perhaps, uh, in such a way to make nuclear uh, commercial power um, very competitive on the on the commercial power um, um, within the commercial power industry. Uh, again, advanced reactors. I think, from my perspective, advanced reactors, micro reactors, the future of uh, reactor technology kind of plays a, a role across a variety of different, um, there is a role being played for advanced reactors, whether those are high temperature gas reactors, molten salt reactors, uh, whatever, these advanced reactors can play a role both in the grid 
uh, but also in areas for deep space exploration. So I'm gonna talk about that. And then finally, something that uh, was one of the first tasks I was given when I joined BWXT, uh, radio pharmacology. It's something that, I'm, um, that I've become very, very um, interested in, not because of the economics, but because of the human factor. So I'm gonna talk a, a bit about uh, the, the efficacy of medical isotopes, uh, nuclear medicine for the benefit of humanity, uh, but I'm gonna come at it from a technology point of view. So hopefully you'll find all of those things compelling. Next slide. So as I mentioned, I joined BWXT thinking uh, that it was a great opportunity for me to use my NASA background uh, to develop something new and novel. Um, I've always been uh, attracted to the development of, uh, of new um, um, technology, new products, whether those for, were for a science mission uh, within NASA or in this instance for a deep space exploration uh, system uh, for human transport to Mars. In, in doing that, in joining BWXT to do this enterprise, what I found uh, what we are finding uh, with, within BWXT and with our partners at DOE uh, and, and NASA is that there's substantial technology development necessary to realize uh, a viable transport system between Mars, uh, Earth and Mars. And as I spoke in Aiken last time, uh, the really, the, the, the talk I gave then was uh, meant to describe why we needed to use nuclear technology to get to, to get to Mars. Today, what I'd rather talk, talk to you about is what the technology needs are to realize space nuclear propulsion systems. So taking a step back, I think it's important to recognize that this has been something that's been worked on since uh, uh, Werner von Braun first developed the idea in the 60s for NERVA. Um, so this isn't a new idea. The difference it, between then and now is the uh, applications of um, computational engineering. Uh, Moore's law has offered us the ability to do much more computational uh, uh, analysis on these systems than was available in, in the 60s. In the 60s, uh, the idea was let's build something, put it in the Nevada desert, turn it on and see what happens. Uh, learn from that and iterate. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a completely legitimate uh, process to go through that rapid uh, uh, testing, but uh, firing a nuclear thermal propulsion system in the Nevada de desert these days uh, is, is a less compelling enterprise because of the uh, environmental impacts, regulatory conditions, et cetera. So that's not something that we're gonna go off and do. However, we still have to build things and test them out. What NASA and DOE are doing these days is testing out a variety of different fuel forms, both the fuel kernel itself, as well as the cladding associated with that fuel form to make sure that we understand exactly how those fuels are gonna stand up to the, the uh, environmental conditions that they'll face in nuclear thermal propulsion. So I'm gonna describe those very quickly. For a, engine such as this to really be effective uh, in transport, uh, transporting humans, you, you essentially have to get to somewhere on the order of eight to 10, maybe upwards of 15 kilometers per second. Uh, a, a velocity such as that is gonna get humans to Mars, you know, somewhere on the order of five to six in, in, a, in a transit time of five to six months. And that's whether it's an opposition or a, conjug uh, a, a conjugation class um, mission. So opposition, conjugation, those are just really where Mars is when you take off relative to Earth. Um, in either instance, uh, it, you, you essentially have to catch up with Mars. And to do so, uh, and travel the distance between Earth and Mars, you got to reach a certain speed if you want to travel that distance uh, and, and overcome the uh, orbital mechanics between the two planets. So 12, you know, let's just say 10 kilometers per second. To achieve 10 kilometers per second, there's a number of different things that you have to do uh, um, within the, the, the nuclear engine itself. So 
above the shield, um, if you're looking at the image on the right here, above that little disc at the top of that image, above that shield is some number of thousands of gallons of cryogenic hydrogen. Uh, that cryogenic hydrogen uh, passes through this uh, engine um, in, in two different phases. Uh, the first phase, it passes through the outer part of the engine and th then down through that funnel at the bottom called the aft skirt. That little funnel at the bottom has to be cooled uh, so that it does, as um, high temperature hydrogen passes through that, that neck, that very tiny little um, component between uh, the, the cylinder above it and the, uh, the, the, the cone below it, as it passes through that, it doesn't heat it uh, and, and etch through that, that throat uh, and cause damage to the, um, the nozzle of the, uh, of the rocket. Same thing happens in, in SpaceX, Blue Origin, NASA rockets as well. Uh, you have to, to, to cool these kinds of systems. Generally, it's, be, it's being done uh, with either uh, um, oxygen or uh, in some cases, nitrogen. In this case, it's going to be done with hydrogen. After that, it circulates through the center of the nuclear reactor core itself. It goes from a temperature of 19.7 Kelvin up to at least 2,700 Kelvin. That, that change in temperature is directly proportional to the change in velocity that you can achieve. If you can get to 2,700 Kelvin, you're about at eight kilometers per second. If you can achieve maybe up to 3,100 Kelvin, you can get to you know, 12 to 15 kilometers per second, depending on how much hydrogen you have above that shield there. So if, if you really wanna to get to Mars quickly, you just have to carry a lot of hydrogen. That hydrogen propellant, when it goes through that little bitty neck between the reactor and the, and the uh, cone, uh, the more hydrogen you have, the longer you can fire that reactor core. Uh, once the reactor, once hydrogen is no longer available to the reactor, you have to shut that thing down and radiate heat into space. So there's a couple of things that I said that are important to back up and understand. If you're going to operate this reactor, you have to operate a reactor that can go from whatever the, the uh, ambient temperature is at the time, probably somewhere on the order of 200 Kelvin, uh, up to 2700 Kelvin. We should note that that occurs within 30 seconds, uh, not normal start time for a nuclear reactor. So it's gonna go from 200 Kelvin to 2700 Kelvin in roughly uh, a minute or so. Obviously it's not gonna change that temperature even though you start the reactor, it's not gonna change that in 30 seconds, but you do go to full power in this reactor over a 30 second uh, um, uh, start time. And the consequences of that are severe. Uh, changes in pressure across the reactor core itself as you go from top to bottom in the reactor core uh, and from side to side, you've got significant pressure differentials that you have to um, um, survive, as well as temperature uh, differences that you have to survive just to reach steady state. And steady state's only 10 to 15 minutes long, uh, and then you shut the reactor off, cool it off, and you're, uh, you're effectively in a, in a coast phase. So the manufacture of fuels uh, that can achieve those temperatures and survive the hysteresis of that temperature differential is very is going to is going to pose some significant manufacturing challenges, and those are the challenges that BWXT, NASA, DOE are working through today. We've been doing this with a variety of different fuel forms, from uranium dioxide to urinal nitrate, uh, taking those fuel forms and and coating them, uh, whether that's with a graphite uh, coating like we would use for uh, triso or some more exotic. Uh, coating, and then putting that coated kernel in uh, some sort of cladded uh, compact, and then finding ways to load those compacts into larger fuel elements. Hard to see in the image, but in top to bottom in that cylinder uh, that sits below, you know, what you would imagine to be the turbo machinery and above that funnel, the, the throat of the rocket motor, inside that reactor core are a number of different fuel channels, each fuel channel made up of fuel compacts, each compact made up of fuel uh, coated kernels. So the development of those fuel kernels, compacts, and fuel elements is really the thrust of the investments being made to date. Obviously, moderators, since this system is planned to be a highly moderated, a thermalized reactor, 
Um, those are going to be future investments that are necessary. Clearly design of a system like this that understands the, the thermal mechanics of the um, flow of hydrogen through this system and the implications of that, the thermionics of that, the nuclear uh, neutron feedback associated with that, all of that is work that's being uh, done today. Now, once we, once we build that reactor core, there's still a lot of novel uh, technology necessary for development that I find um, uh, to be challenging and compelling. Uh, high, the, the high flow rates of hydrogen through turbo machinery, that's not a common uh, use of the turbo machinery that we have today. Rolls-Royce is not out building uh, uh, high thrust hydrogen systems for uh, you know, an Airbus. That's just not the kind of systems that we, we've been building. So finding ways to make turbo machinery that can manage cryogenic hydrogen and hydrogen that's um, being heated simultaneously, mind you, um, is, is gonna be a future uh, endeavor that's necessary to overcome if these systems are gonna be realized. So there's a lot of technology development uh, necessary so, so that this particular variant of, of a high temperature gas reactor uh, will be useful for NASA moving forward. I'm sure I know what the time is. N next slide. Not only does NASA want to use high temperature gas reactors for deep space propulsion, uh, but uh, also for in space power. So for NASA, they, they've talked about fission surface systems, the fission surface systems uh, necessary for sustainable life, uh, a, a sustained human presence on the moon. NASA calls this the Artemis program. Um, whether that's a high temperature gas reactor or a heat conversion system uh, akin to the, the Krusty program led from Los Alamos, some system like that has to work in the harsh environment of the moon and Mars. These are dusty environments on the moon. It's called regolith. This is a highly uh, electrified uh, fine dust. The Apollo astronauts came back covered in this mess. Um, but that regolith, uh, since it carries a static charge, offers a really unique problem to solve, a challenge to overcome uh, for the fission surface systems to be used on the moon. So in addition to developing systems like shown in the upper right for deep space propulsion, uh, we're also looking into, uh, as a uh, industry, as a, as, a, as a nation, the development of fission surface systems that can be used uh, in unique conditions like the lunar environment. And so there's a variety of different implications that has, but what we're finding is that the use of the development of those technologies is going to have very appreciable impacts uh, for not just the development, the uh, production of electricity for the moon, but also for heat. And the consequences of that heat has lots of different in industrial applications on the moon. On the moon, they're planning on using that to convert uh, lunar ice into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen for propellant and fuel, oxygen obviously for, for human sustained uh, presence. Um, so that hydrogen production, that cracking of uh, water on the moon offers us uh, technology development uh, pathways for the cracking of hydrogen here on Earth, for the production of hydrogen uh, as an energy supply on Earth. So there's a lot of uh, interesting and compelling interest in the development of these technologies, not just for space exploration, but for the, the benefits they have here back, back home. Um, this is being done through a, a series of different public and private partnerships. Um, whether that's within the DOE or NASA, there's a lot of technology development for what's being called in situ resource utilization, taking that regolith I mentioned and converting it into iron ore, aluminum, uh, and actually doing additive manufacturing within the lunar environment. So a lot of very compelling uh, um, investment and technology maturation going on in support of the, the systems that will be utilized with the power supplies uh, the fission surface power systems being developed by the agencies. Next slide. So I want to talk about, uh, I mentioned uh, additive manufacturing in space, uh, but there's a variety of different ad additive uh, and advanced manufacturing system um, technologies that I believe are going to uh, help advance nuclear as, as an industry. 3D printing, uh, the 
transformational challenge reactor within Oak Ridge. I'll show an example of that in a moment. Um, 3D printing really offers us an opportunity not just to make components for nuclear reactors, but to make full systems uh, for nuclear reactors. Um, Multi-metal uh, um, printing systems are coming online that offer us the ability to make a variety of different components that have multiple uh, metals from Inconel to nickel al uh, other nickel alloys uh, with copper uh, cladding uh, or other types of cladding um, coated on uh, a, 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 a component while it's being manufactured, adding in electronics or sensor systems uh, while you're making these uh, different um, materials, add to this idea of in, in the industry 4.0. If you can have a nuclear reactor with embedded sensors within it, eventually you can get to a nuclear reactor that can take that information, understand the end state status of that reactor and help automate some of the systems associated with the, the operation of that, that reactor. Now, I'm not saying we're going to replace persons at the power plant, but we can automate some of these systems in such a way that it makes it smarter, safer, uh, and cheaper to operate. And by adding in sensor systems, uh, uh, sensor technologies within the reactor core and the reactor pressure vessel and the overall uh, uh, balance uh, of the, the, the system, we can get to a state where a lot of information is gathered that can help us both understand the safety and status of the system, but also operate it in, a, in an effective and efficient manner. So those different areas of 3D printing are, I think, compelling areas uh, for the development of technologies associated with nuclear. And the Department of Energy and, and BWXT are pursuing uh, the, those investments, those, those developments. So whether it's for components or for fuel, uh, additive manufacturing offers a, a variety of different benefits for geometry, for uh, economies of scale, and I really think um, we're going to see a lot of advancement in those different areas uh, in, the, in the next three to five years. Uh, the reduction of those design constraints offers us the ability to, to make new and more novel uh, um, systems. And I'm going to show an example of that in a moment. In, in a moment. So I'm going to skip that, that bullet um, and go on to the next slide, please. So these advanced reactors with their new designs, whether that's a high temperature gas reactor, molten salt, uh, et cetera, the intent is to have safer and more economic reactor systems. Um, they're, they're generally smaller than a gigawatt uh, system that you might find at, at Watts Bar or Browns Ferry. Uh, and they have additional capabilities like load following uh, and modular construction. Now, SMRs, small modular reactors like New Scale, um, you know, effectively are advanced versions of light water reactors, but uh, they do offer the ability to be modularly constructed and transported to the location where they they're going to be installed and operated. Um, newer versions uh, or high temperature gas reactors, molten salt reactors like uh, natrium from TerraPower, those those types of systems being even smaller or easier, even easier. Uh, to manufacture on an, uh, at, an, at an industrial plant uh, and make multiple versions of them annually. Uh, so you can imagine being able to make hundreds of these smaller reactors over the course of a decade and deploy them in, in the same sorts of ways uh, that small coal fire plants uh, were, were deployed in the early uh, um, 20th century. And so if you can get to a, a scenario where you can make those hundreds of reactors in a cost competitive way, you really can see growth uh, for the nuclear industry, both for manufacturing and for operation. And hopefully uh, additive manufacturing and other industry 4.0 types of technologies will get us there. Next slide. So I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes and then hopefully take some questions on medical isotopes. Um, I think many of you are probably aware of the um, benefits radiopharmacology has uh, for the treatment, um, for the, at least for the diagnosis of cancer. Molybdenum-99 and its decay product, technetium-99M, uh, is the most widely used 
uh, uh, radio pharma, um, pharmaceutical um, on, on the planet today. Uh, when molybdenum-99 decays to technetium, it emits 140 keV photon. That gamma ray can be collected in a solid state detector. Uh, and since uh, given that you can put in 30 millicuries, you can put a lot of molybdenum-99 atoms, you can get a lot of 140 keV photons emitted as a function of time when injected into a person. And the way that these things work is that uh, tech, that molybdenum-99 molecule is combined with what's called a molecular vector, a protein, or some other type of molecule that when injected into a person goes, goes to the specific location in the body where that protein can be um, collected and uh, molecularly connects uh, to some cell type within the body. So that vector, that process by which that connection occurs uh, can be sp um, specific to a liver, to a brain, to a heart, uh, et cetera. So uh, these, these molecular vectors can be developed that target specific um, organs and systems within the body, and then they attach the, uh, radio, uh, the radio isotope to that vector and can do diagnostic studies as a consequence. There are 15, 16 different versions of those molecular vectors that work with mo molybdenum-99, and consequently, they're used to study the heart, the lungs, the brain. Uh, these different types of studies are done in near real time. Uh, and by near real time, I mean you're looking at someone's heart and the um, perfusion, the diffusion of that uh, radiopharmaceutical drug. You're watching that happen, you know, microseconds uh, after its actual occurrence. So you're seeing in effectively real time. Uh, the function of someone's heart dynamically, watching it beat, watching the lungs expand, watching this radiopharmacy drug uh, uh, diffuse through that organ. And that diagnostic tool then can be used to find where it's not diffusing. In the case of a lung, for example, where is that, uh, that, that drug not making it? In the case of the lung, it's not making it to a, the locations where there's a tumor, where that molecular vector does not actually attach because it, it's not built to attach to uh, um, cancer cells. And consequently, it becomes a very good, strong diagnostic for the locations of tumors and, and poor functioning systems within uh, the brain or, or, or the heart. Consequently, 40 million people per year uh, get, get that kind of uh, diagnostic injection. What we're finding, uh, what the medical community is, has determined is that they can not only, these radiopharmacy drugs can not only be used to diagnose ailments like cancer, but also treat them. So not only does the emission of gamma rays allow us to detect the uh, locations of these uh, um, radioisotopes, but through beta and alpha decay, we can use those decay mechanisms to actually treat uh, uh, that ailment. So you take uh, an isotope like lutetium and you inject it uh, in, with the inclusion of a molecular vector that carries that lutetium to a pancreas or to a prostate. And the emission of the betas coming off the lutetium can actually erode, destroy, um, somehow diminish the number of cancer cells in a man's prostate. And they're finding those to be very effective treatments. Actinium-225, lead, bismuth, these types of heavy elements are being used for their alpha decay pro uh, um, uh, properties. Those helium nuclei being ejected from those uh, heavy element nuclei slam into to, to cancer cells, especially metastatic and nodular tum tumors like sarcomas, and are very effective treatments uh, for, for the, for the destruction of those types of uh, uh, cancers. And many studies have been done on actinium recently that show uh, how, how compelling a solution, how efficacious a drug, uh, those actinium um, uh, and, and bismuth and lead type drugs are for, for these fairly egregious uh, and fast growing tumor types. So, Department of Energy, uh, Health and Human Services, the National Cancer Institute, 
uh, these different government agencies are spending a fair amount of our research and development dollars to understand the benefits of a variety of different radioisotopes and the uh, developed radiopharmaceutical drugs uh, associated with them. And for me, uh, I find uh, the development of those types of things to, to, to really be a great um, and compelling, not, not only business case, but a great way for us to use the, the types of technologies that are inherent within the nuclear industry, nuclear chemistry, uh, those, those types of um, special handling um, technologies necessary for us to do the jobs that we do, to take those technologies that we've developed for the handling of fuel, spent fuel, recycling, uh, things, things that are kind of core to the Savannah River uh, competency set. Uh, take those technologies that we've developed for radiochemistry and apply them for the development of diagnostic and therapeutic drugs for cancer. I think it's a great way for us to, to uh, um, make a substantial and positive impact uh, on, on society, humanity. So really compelling use of our technology and something that, that, I, that I found a lot of professional joy uh, pursuing here, here within BWXT. I think if we go on to the next slide, uh, essentially, um, I'm going to wrap up here. Obviously, I'm super excited about nuclear thermal propulsion. I spent a lot of time talking about it. BWXT has been working on these encapsulated fuels, showing you some examples there of uh, TRISO in the uh, upper upper right-hand corner where we're, we're making fuel today. Uh, we're also three-dimensionally printing things. That's a molybdenum 3D printed fuel uh, uh, compact in the bottom right that we, we developed in collaboration through a cost share with the Department of Energy at Oak Ridge. Super excited about the development of those types of technologies as well. We can effectively make enough of those fuel compacts in 57 hours to fuel a nuclear reactor core. So we can make uh, enough of those canisters and the fuel above it in, in just a week's time to, to get to where we would have manufactured enough components to, to, manu to, to assemble a nuclear reactor core. Getting to my point from earlier, where we might one day be able to make many reactors per year in a cost-effective way. Um, so these micro reactors, the, the fuels that we're making for them, uh, I think, and the, the development of technologies for additive manufacturing really are gonna lead through, lead to an ability for advanced reactors to be a cost-effective economic boon for the nuclear industry moving forward. I think the combination of all these things is the nuclear that we need. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed my, um, my one-sided arguments uh, for why these things are compelling. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy, uh, I'd be happy to uh, attempt to answer them. Great, thank you, Jonathan. That was, that was awesome. That was really a enlightening uh, presentation, I guess. I know there's a couple questions that we have uh, typed in, but I'm gonna start with one. And uh, just to comment first is uh, being a material scientist, materials engineer, I, this is exciting. I kind of wish I was back in my start of my career where I could do all these uh, great things and, and look at developing these materials for the harsh environments that you talk about. And one, one question I've always had and uh, about additive manufacturing and, and 3D printing and thing of, of materials is a wonderful technology, but we know that the microstructure of a material is very important to the pro ultimate properties and response of that material to the environment that it's gonna be used in. And, uh, and especially in these harsh environments, what's the confidence that 3D printed or, or uh, additive manufacturing components made with these materials that are often sintered or or has gone through a rot, careful controlled rot process or casting process are going to have those same uh, microstructural characteristics that are going to make them reliable. So Jim, that, that, that's a great question and that's a problem that has to be solved before anyone's going to allow you to put one of these systems into the main area of a reactor core. What we're finding through um, specific technologies like um, E-beam or uh, um, laser deposition is that you can actually control the microstructure of the 
uh, the, the grown part in such a way that you can influence the response of that part, the um, structure of that grain to, um, through design, have it built in such a way, have it grown in such a way that it responds to the, the physics, the engineering, the load uh, um, to a maximum benefit. A cast part is generally going to have an isotropic grain structure, right? You're just pressing the uh, material into its its specific place. Um, so you know you you end up with something that's more or less isotropic. These grown parts, you can either have it be isotropic because of the way in which you influence the melt pool for the 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 powder that you're you're laser centering, or you can have the grain structure line up such that it's perpendicular to the imp to the to the load, or it's parallel to the to the load, depending on how you want shear forces and stresses to line up relative to the load. So groups like the um, manufacturing development facility at Oak Ridge and the uh, a similar group out at Idaho. There's a, there's a new group at Savannah River that's looking into these microstructures as well. Um, what they're doing is they're looking at how you can influence the build characteristics of the parts that are being used that are being made in these different uh, 3D printing technologies and, and grow them in such a way, manufacturing them in such a way that they're engineering, they're engineered to overcome or accommodate the stresses of, this, of the uh, situation that they're put in. So the, there's that aspect to it. The, the other aspect to it is these, these 3D printers, you can embed infrared and optical sensors, cameras inside those parts that are collecting data up at the rate at which the part's being built. And you can compare the data for that build process to the engineered digital model that you created when the engineer actually designed the part. And you can compare the part itself and as it's being built to what the physics of the engineered design uh, indicate are the stresses and loads uh, that that part's gonna have to bear. And that allows you to then build the part in such a way that it accommodates the, the design loads. So those are things that you can't do in cast parts, right? You just, you, you can't do that in, in a forging in the same way that you can do that in a 3D build. So do 3D, do I think 3D printers are gonna, you know, obviate the need for die cast manufacturing? No, uh, but they do offer us the ability to make parts in ways that you can't make or that you could make cheaper uh, than, than, than die cast and, and forging. So I think that there's work that needs to be done as an example, take that 3D printed uh, part that I showed in molybdenum. You need to put that into a neutron environment like treat or ATR, irradiate it, see what creep looks like, see what uh, neutron bombardment does for an embrittlement of those types of uh, those, those metals and materials and confirm that the results uh, don't, um, you know, they're, they're not in conflict with the model. Sorry for the long-winded response, but no, that's an important, that's it's an important problem that needs to be solved, but I think that there's a lot of data that can be developed in these systems that can be used in advanced model and simulation systems that are now available to actually confirm that these are going to work uh, and then be used in a relevant way. Good. Okay, thank you. I, I think there's a bunch of other questions that have come in. Uh, Allison, maybe you, you've done a good job in the past of, of fielding these, so... Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the first the first comment was, you know, thank you for the talk, very interesting. There seems to be a lot of different research demands. Um, could you briefly discuss how BWXT handles research? What level of investment in people, in money, in facilities? And what partners do you work with? Higher education institutions? Do you work with DARPA, NSF, et cetera? Okay, well, that's a great question. Um, First of all, uh, within we, we spend about uh, one to five percent of our gross revenue uh, per year on internal research and, and development uh, efforts. Some of the, some of that R and D uh, within BWXT is um, just internal, right? We're we're specifically looking at the development of molybdenum ninety nine. We're investing heavily in that uh, technology. Um, and 
spending both R&D and capital at this point in the development and deployment of that technology. Um, and, and consequently, uh, we've been investing both in facilities and uh, technology, intellectual property, but also in people. Uh, we've been hiring radio chemists and uh, pharmacologists and clinicians, um, roboticists, a uh, variety of different, um, I would say, new engineering uh, constructs within BWXD uh, so that we have the workforce capacity to deploy such a system uh, in a new and novel way. So one area of investment that we have through our R&D portfolio uh, really uses, you know, what I would say, uh, uh, an agency approach uh, where we take proposals uh, for um, R&D projects from the workforce and rate them relative to our strategic plan and see whether or not those are going to be um, good returns on investment for us. Uh, so we have an R&D portfolio that fo follows that, you know, return on invested capital kind of approach based on whatever our, what, what our internal strategic plan is. And we also cost share, whether that's with the Department of Energy through uh, their ver various cost share programs or uh, NASA, uh, which has what they call public-private partnerships, where we uh, um, submit for investment, co-investment in technology development, um, and with DARPA. Uh, that was an example that was used. So the seedling programs within DARPA offer us examples from where we can offer us opportunities where we can apply through broad area uh, 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 agreements. Um, we can apply for, for technology developments. We do all of that. We also invest at universities for low TRL work. We're, we're working with uh, at least five universities I can think of off the top of my head in the development of low TRL uh, technologies, whether those are for fuels at Oak Ridge, at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, or additive manufacturing technologies at, at Ohio State. Uh, we're spending our dollars with university professors and students to, uh, to, to develop those technologies. And, and one of the intended side effects of that is the workforce development that we get through intern programs at universities, and also these projects that we fund at universities, we're, we're, we're collecting up high quality uh, workforce uh, in our, you know, as a, as a uh, individual graduates from one of these universities, in, in fact, we've been offering them jobs as interns, you know, you're a great intern, here's your job offer, uh, let us know when you graduate kind of thing. Uh, we've also been investing in universities by taking aerospace engineering graduates that have just completed their bachelor's degree and funding them to get a nuclear engineering master's degree. So we've done that on several occasions as well. Hopefully that, that was a comprehensive answer to that question. Well, there, there is a question that's very similar to that. Um, is BW, BWXT working with SpaceX to move away from kerosene to hydrogen hyaline or another non-fossil fuel? We're not working with SpaceX, but we're working with another industrial partner to do that, whose name I can't mention. Uh, okay. SpaceX, SpaceX is actually interested, and we've been talking with them about uh, surface power systems. That's where uh, SpaceX has their primary interest. But the, uh, the BFR uh, that SpaceX is developing is a LOX kerosene system based on their Merlin engine. I think that's what they call it. But uh, that their big engine that you'll see them launch Starship on here in the short term, that's a LOX kerosene system that they've been working on for a while. So their engine systems uh, in, the, in the near term, they intend to, to keep chemical. So we have a student with us from Denmark Technical College, which is a small technical school here that um, SRS has an MOU with. And he was curious, what level of knowledge or skill would you expect from a two-year college graduate to be useful with your company, whether it be additive manufacturing, welding, what skills would you expect them to have? So engineering technology as a two-year degree is something that we, you know, we, we pursue graduates with those associate degrees uh, for engineering technology. Uh, IT uh, is, a, is, a, is a significant area of interest for ours. Um, as we digitize a lot of our systems, our um, information technology workforce portfolio is expanding. So there are a variety of different associate, variety of different associate degree uh, backgrounds that we're interested in from engineering uh, technology to uh, information technology. 
but also at least insofar as the additive manufacturing um, uh, question goes, uh, specific within engineering technology is the development of um, programmable logic controls, PLC systems to operate uh, those, uh, those 3D printing systems. Just because you go to General Electric and buy, uh, you know, one of their big laser weld systems um, and, and have it installed, you got to be able to operate it, which means you got to be able to program it, which means you have to have a background in PLC technology. And that's something that a lot of places uh, that offer engineering technology associate degrees um, have as a uh, uh, speciality that you can pursue. So a variety of different things like that, but, but one area that I think is very specific to BWXT, I don't know if that's something that's specific to Savannah River, but we have associate uh, um, degree, um, people with associate degrees that, that are looking at more traditional areas like welding. Welding is a huge area for us where we have, you know, literally hundreds of employees that specialize in, in welding technology, engineers that are um, looking at how specific types of welds can be done in, in ways that don't create cracks and voids, what the metrology is associ associated with welding to make sure and confirm using ultrasonic or uh, x-ray or other types of uh, metrology tools that the weld um, that was applied was the weld that was intended. So there's, a, there's a, actually a variety of different things that we're interested in for folks with two-year degrees. Okay. Um, amid all of the new technologies you discussed today, are there standards bodies that exist to develop the standards in the areas? Um, what are, how does BWXT participate in creating the standards? So um, that, that, that's, that's a great question. Uh, here's an interesting anecdote. When Babcock, when Wilcox generate, when Wilcox created the first steam generator back in the 1800s, uh, the the benefit of a of a Babcock and Wilcox steam generator, that pressure vessel, was that it wouldn't blow up, uh, and and it wasn't the cheapest system on the on the market, but it was the most reliable, and consequently, a market developed uh, for B and W uh, pressure vessels, the boilers. Um, and ASME code was developed as a consequence of the B&W process by which it made these uh, systems that didn't blow up. So BWXD has actually been in the code business since boilers uh, became an industrial product for B&W. Uh, we've been working with groups like EPRI and others in, in you know, ASME-like code development uh, for materials associated with 3D printing. I think there's a long way to go there. I think We've been looking to DOE for, for leadership and they are providing it. I'm not saying that they're not, but through EERE uh, and other uh, aspects of uh, the energy enterprise within DOE, people are starting to look at what the code base needs are. Uh, we've been talking uh, as an industry, we've been talking through uh, our advocacy groups and, and as an industry participant ourselves with groups like the NRC about what their codes are. Um, we've been talking with the CNSC uh, in Canada about what their requirements would be for, for code development, certification, verification, and validation processes for these types of systems. So while it's a bit nascent at the moment, uh, there's beginning, beginning to become a process in place for the certification of these systems and the demonstration and efficacy of a given part uh, to meet that, that, that code case. So more work to be done, but I think we're starting to see uh, um, a path forward there. Um, then the next question, what do you think the next quote, new nuclear project should be at SRS? And do you think it should be DOE led or company led using SRS resources? Well, per personally, I thought I think there's a variety of different things that the radiochemistry capacity at SRS is meant to solve. I mean, uh, liquid waste is, is not a problem that's going away anytime soon and finding new and novel ways to manage uh, liquid waste is, a, is, a, is an important problem that, that needs to be solved. If nuclear is gonna grow up as, a, uh, a, a, as an industry in the way that I you know, have, have advocated, 
um, and expand to hundreds of reactors. Uh, um, management of that waste, finding ways to take spent fuel and, and package and store it is a, is, a, is a critical problem that needs to be solved. And I think that Savannah River's the kind of place where you'd wanna solve that. Other things that I think um, kind of in the heritage of, of SRS, uh, the development of new applications for isotopes for power uh, storage, energy conversion, leptonic fuels, other kind of advanced uh, fuel development types, again, in the wheelhouse of, of, the, uh, uh, of the lab. So I think in areas like that, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think that those are areas that DOE could and should invest and Savannah River would definitely be the place uh, for those developments. That's Jonathan's personal opinion. Uh, I'm not speaking for BWXD when I say those kinds of things. All right, thank you. Um, in terms of TLR, sorry, TRL, MRL advancement, how do you view the role of BWXT and industry partners compared to the role of government laboratories? Well, government laboratories have to do the initial investment and in R&D development. I mean, it's, it's, a com it's a substantial commercial risk for a company like BWXT to invent something out of the clear blue sky because you don't know what the commercial benefit of that uh, technology development is. I mean, BWXT would never go out and try and develop 3D printing uh, as a technology. But once 3D printing technology becomes a, um, a capability, then BWXT would work and does work with DOE and, and other government agencies to find ways to use that technology for commercial benefit. Uh, so I think that national labs um, serve a critical role to the US commercial uh, industry, whether that's commercial for government use or commercial strictly just to generate cash uh, for the benefit of products and, and things that are of economic benefit for people and they want to pay for it. Uh, whatever whatever those end states are for commerce, uh, the development of capabilities, the initial investment in R&D to develop new and novel technologies, that's what labs are for. Um, and whether that's for nuclear or wind or cyber or whatever, uh, those initial investments, the development of new, new stuff uh, is really what I think government uh, should be investing in. Once you have a thing, uh, once you have developed a nuclear fuel type, um, once you've developed a nuclear reactor type, uh, then manufacturing that and making it available for commercial sale, that's, that's where a BWXT, a New Scale, a Westinghouse, a General Electric should step in, take developed technologies, license them, and license that technology and, and go off and, and develop it for, for commercial application. So there, I think there's a real benefit to commercial public private partnerships, low TRL development within government, TRL, uh, MRL uh, improvements in collaboration with industry, and then eventually manufacturing readiness uh, uh, execution at the commercial scale uh, by, by individual companies. So we have two questions that are kind of related, so I'm gonna try and combine them. Um, in your opinion, is there a future for liquid fuel reactors in space travel or commercial power? And are you investigating a fusion-based space propulsion system? Hmm, so those are two questions. The first question, the, the benefits of liquid cooled reactors come into play when you talk about nuclear electric propulsion. Uh, for nuclear thermal propulsion, if, if, if that's the end state um, that you're going after, gas is the way to go uh, because that's where you're gonna get the most uh, delta T uh, uh, and, and then in the end, delta V. But for liquids, using a liquid cooled reactor um, um, is, especially if you're using liquid metals, uh, it's gonna be really critical for the development of nuclear electric propulsion. And nuclear electric propulsion, if you really wanna explore the solar system, that's where you gotta go. If you wanna get the Alpha Centauri, that's where you gotta go. Because nuclear electric propulsion is, is not only can you get to high velocity, but it's very fuel efficient. So you don't have to carry as much uh, propellant along with you if you wanna get to high velocity by, by the application of the conversion of electricity into the acceleration of the propellant. Uh, so those liquid cooled reactors 
uh, are really the way to go for nuclear electric propulsion. Fusion, um, Dyson recently passed away. Um, Dyson was one of the first ad, uh, advocates for, fu for fission, fusion in space. And not only was the Dyson sphere a great Star Trek episode, uh, the, the way Dyson envisioned fusion being used uh, was um, not really in the generation of electricity, but the, the, the generation of heat energy within uh, um, a fusion system for propulsion. I think if, if we get to the point where we can confine fusion in such a way uh, that, that we could use it as propulsion, we will have done some pretty significant things because the use of magnetic fields uh, for that confinement is, is really going to be what we use as the propellant. And what I mean by that is modification of magnetic fields uh, and their relationship with the existing fields outside of the spacecraft are, are going to be very clever ways for um, um, us moving systems through space, probably a thousand years from now. Uh, literally. Um, but, you know, I think fission systems for, for deep space propulsion are where human humanity will be within the next hundred years. And those fission systems will allow us in what I mean by deep space here in this instance is out to Jupiter. Um, and we'll be able to explore Jupiter both robotically and with humans using fission based propulsion systems. Uh, so I think that's, that's where we're going to, that's where we're going to go in the near term. And that's where my interests are. So we have a gentleman with us who is a five-year nuclear Navy officer veteran, has a bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering, and is curious what you would suggest that he pursue if he wanted to be more involved in or pursue um, either the medical isotope production or the space division production. Yeah, with, with respect to like graduate degrees or, or education, I think was the question. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your service. Uh, secondly, I would say that if you've already got a bachelor's degree in that, um, if you've already got a bachelor's degree in, in nuclear engineering, you're probably already uh, qualified to, to work in that area for us. Um, if you want to do a, a to, to go with, with a, a go into an advanced degree, uh, there molecular biology that's that's where you go um nuclear engineers with a molecular biology medical degree are unicorns in our business and are highly sought after uh um, um people in, in our in our workforce not just for us uh but groups like curium cardinal health a variety um uh novartis Bayer, Oak Ridge National Lab, all of those kinds of folks are looking for people that both understand molecular biology, how to make those molecular vectors I talked about, and uh, uh, radioisotope isotopes, you know, the, the, the nuclear engineering aspects of your background. So if you wanted to get a, wanted to go after a master's degree in something, I'd say molecular biology uh, is a great way to do that, or is a great, uh, is, is a great one. So the final question, and then we're going to end Q&A, and thank you for your time. Um, we have to ask this. H how has COVID-19 requirements for teleworking and the shutdown and social distancing and all of that, how has that impacted the scope of the different projects you talked about today? Um, utilization of our workforce is at an all-time high. So what that mean, what I mean by that is uh, indirect work is something that we have seen plummet uh, as a consequence of teleworking. Our engineering staff are spending most of their time uh, on direct uh, uh, direct contract work, and consequently, uh, we're seeing a you know kind of a an economic benefit really. Uh, I hate to say it, it sounds like I'm making light of the terrible pandemic situation, but the, the fact of the matter is, is our utilization is up. Um, 
for the tele for the for the persons within our company that are um, capable of teleworking. Now, a lot of our workforce are people that are making stuff, uh, whether that's medical isotopes or naval reactors, uh, and they can't telework. Um, fortunately for us, BWXT has seen no deaths to date from COVID-19, which with a workforce of 7,000 people, uh, that's, that's a, I think that's a pretty incredible statistic. Uh, we, we do have cases on the rise, unfortunately, uh, which is impacting uh, our workforce. Um, and so for telework, I'd say the benefits for our engineering staff have been increasing utilization. Uh, but for our, for our manufacturing staff, it's been, it's been a challenge to uh, make sure that we're available for work every day. But the last aspect of that that I would say um, is something that I think everyone should bear in mind is mental health. The mental health associated with the pandemic, uh, I think has a substantial negative deleterious impact on social interactions. And consequently, I've challenged the workforce I work with to frequently reach out to their colleagues, peers, supervisors, and, and have non-work related conversations. Continue to be humans like you would at the, at the uh, water cooler. And the, I think that there's no amount of time uh, wasted uh, in doing that. It, I think it's critical for us to be mindful of the impacts that a change in societal interaction has on susceptible persons. Some people are gonna be resilient to this. If you're an introvert and you really liked being in your basement, being in your basement more may be great. But if you're not an introvert, if you're an extrovert and you really enjoyed the social interactions that you had with your colleagues at work and you now don't have that, that's gonna have a substantial negative impact on, on your mental health. And consequently, I think it's important for us all to recognize that that's a thing uh, and reach out to our fellow colleagues and make sure that they're uh, they're maintaining their mental health and safety. Great, thank thank you, Jonathan. I think that's great words of wisdom, and we we always ask that one to our speakers because I know there's a lot of managers and other folks that are on the line that are are struggling and and going through the same situations that that you're going through, and and certainly want to you know share share the information. 